Nessa girl. Before I get on this airplane, baby, I said I'll call y'all to talk about these housewives from last night in an attempt to be on time and not give it to y'all later on tonight or tomorrow, but a bitch too got a flight to catch. Nevertheless, Real Housewives of Atlanta opens up last night with Portia thought ass mama coming to Dennis little ass restaurant. Now, I'm going to say this, right? I'm not trying to be one of those people to marginalize what somebody do for a living. But y'all please stop blowing up crew like it's just the hottest, biggest damn club in the whole Atlanta. First and foremost, and yes, it's more than what the fuck I got, but crew is the size of a goddamn shoebox, okay? Let me tell you something. Don't ever, ever try to go to crew and you got more than three people with you because bitch, you not going to find nowhere to sit for four goddamn people. Matter of fact, I'm surprised they had a booth in that bitch big enough to accommodate Dennis big ass and Miss Diane post-operation have an ass, okay? Let's talk about that for a minute. Portia took her Real Housewives of Atlanta money. She went and bought her a car. She went and bought her a house. And then she went to Dr. Curtis and got a two-for-one body special. Yes, God. She got her done. She got Miss Diane done. Miss Diane look good. Miss Diane really do look good. I'm not going to lie to you. I just wish that she would be a little more age-appropriate with her fashions and, you know, I ain't trying to police no woman's body. I ain't trying to police her femininity. But I just do think there is an age where a body con dress should be burned, bitch. I would like to see Miss Diane give more of a Vivica Fox, Cynthia Bailey tease when it comes to her fashion and not coming in with body con and gray hair on. I mean, is you 57 or is you 37? Which one, ma? Um, nevertheless, you know, Miss Diane, I think you about as foolish as Portia sitting up on this camera talking about I feel something and I thank you her soul man how the fuck now I see where the fuck Portia get this dingy ass shit from she think the man her soul made after five months and you think the man her soul made after five minutes I guess they say when you know you know quiet as it's kept honey your mama ain't raised no fool bitch you said <laughs> I was about to go somewhere historical, but I had to catch myself. Nevertheless, we see you, Miss Diane. We see you and the new you. Um, Portia with the matching tattoos. Let me tell you something. Portia, you ain't no damn fool. You ain't went and got his goddamn name. You went and got some versatile shit. And if that relationship fall apart, bitch, this could have a dual meaning. I know that's goddamn right. I'm thinking you went and put Dennis on there. Portia say, bitch, Dennis might go bankrupt and I might have to leave, honey. <laughs> Not today. Now what goddamn neck? Okay, what it was? Faith, prosperity, and something else or another. It was cute. It was cute. Behind the ear. Um, Marlo. You got all the fashions, right? So this Christmas, Marlo had the people. Marlo had the people. Anybody who would know and love Marlo Hampton. In lieu of buying her a Neiman Marcus gift card, can we please buy her a Rosetta Stone for English? Matter of fact, get her the intensive one for English. That's the second language for people. This bitch got on a live national, local, regional TV and said... Oh, Cynthia, I like it when you dress more feminine. Huh? What you said? How she dressed, girl? Feminine. I think you meant feminine. And it's so funny because I got another friend who be saying feminine. And I just don't understand how your brain and your tongue. Well, I know how Marlo's tongue messed it up. Bitch. She sucks so much dick. It's heavy. It's disabled on the left-hand side. That's how she was able to buy that outfit, though. Bitch, I might not be able to speak. But, uh, but I'm dressing like T.S. Madison said. I'm not saying don't suck dick. I'm just saying don't get up with a hurt throat and an empty pocketbook. I know that's right, honey. Marlo's camp in school of home now taking applications for the fall 20, I mean for the spring 2019 class. Just do not pay by credit because you might pay for your application, her application, his application and people did made me application at the same damn time and you know what we finna say baby not with my goddamn money um I, <laughs> what's going on today marlo you didn't even deserve that much for you to be a b character so the lady sit down and eat and candy asks should she tell portia no you shouldn't tell portia what the fuck you should do is stop talking about this shit on camera because you already know you and first of all you know 
I'm starting to realize that foresight is not a gift that a lot of people have. You know what I'm saying? And it's like after being on this show, as long as you've been, fuck this show, just being a, a, a normal human with normal friends, Candy should have had enough foresight to already see how this situation is going to play out. I can already tell you now how this ends. The season will end with Portia and Candy not really doing too well and probably fussing at one another at the reunion. Their relationship was already too volatile. And I'm going to tell you something. All these years, you know, Candy has been, she was never the one pegged in the messy box. She's been pegged in a lot of other boxes, not really the messy box. This season, I'm pegging Candy in the messy box because it seems like Candy is genuinely interested in all this dentist stuff. And I hate to say it, but it feels as if she's getting some subconscious delight out of talking about it with the ladies. Like my whole thing is if Portia and Phaedra put you through as much emotional turmoil as you sat up on that TV and fucking cried about continuously to the point of exhaustion for all of us, then it would just seem to me that you would want no confusion with her. Like go start a fight with Cynthia or somebody and you can see that Ty is not here for it. Even messy ass Don Juan is not here for it. Every time you mention Portia, they fucking cringe. They cringe. Now with me knowing Candy and her camp as well as I do, this is out of pocket. This is very uncharacteristic of Candy, which is leading me to believe mentally and emotionally Candy wanted to take a break this season. So she's just like, I'm just going to ride the wave. I'm just going to do the bare minimum or I'm going to take the easy way out and just be messy. Or she and Todd ain't got shit worth talking about this season, which is fine because they've had so much to talk about for so many other seasons. So it's cool if you just want to take a break on the shit being around you. But I just feel like, Candy, you should have been more creative and been able to find another angle than to be harping on this Porsche stuff and spreading this Porsche stuff amongst the ladies. Because no matter how you slice it and dice it, it looks messy. And coming off of y'all's past, it looks vindictive and intentional. And that, that you know, is why I just wish Candy would just stop talking about this shit. Like, even with Jamie filming up to the scene, you know, I know, I, I be around all of y'all enough to know how this shit go. It's like, yeah, Jamie, come up here and film a scene with us real quick. We're going to talk about that portion stuff. That's how it went. How fitting, Jamie. Can, uh, I'm not even finna die, unravel this whole damn show. Just Candy, I just really wish you would stop it because it's disappointing. Eva and that mama with that wedding dress shopping. Eva, your mama is a lot. And I was glad when you finally told her, like, my, you cannot go around saying you don't like something before I even see it. It was just, you, you, you know, your mama was, for whatever reason, she gave me a, the emotion I felt when Mama Joyce would come at Candy about her prospects and dating were the same emotions that I felt when Eva's mom was talking about her in their wedding dress. It, um, it was like, girl, you doing too much. And what made it even worse is when y'all went to eat and the mama was talking about the guest list and then how she shut Eva down. It was like, we're not going to have this conversation. And she started crying. Now, I'm sorry, and y'all have gotten on me in the past about this. I must be a fucked up individual with a very problematic upbringing and raising because at 35, and I believe Eva is 37, my family nor my parents have that much dominion over me or emotional control. They just don't. And I'm sorry, some people may argue that me and my family fucked up or I didn't grow up right or I got a fucked up relationship with my parents and my family. But I just don't feel like at 35 years old, 37 in Eva's case, that there should be a, ever a situation where I'm sitting here discussing what I want to do with my life and my wedding that I and my husband are about to pay for and my mother because of what she wants in my wedding brings me to tears. I'm sorry, the way the protons, neutrons, and atoms in my brain set up, that just don't make sense. Like, had it been me, I would have looked my mother or my father dead square in the face and said, 
Mr. Johnson and Miss Robbie can't come and that's the end of it and we're not having this conversation. But then y'all want to jump in and maybe call me rude and disrespectful. I don't see what's wrong with saying it to the mama. Now I totally agree with the mom for wanting to invite people that helped you get to that moment. But at the end of the day, ma, you owe some sort of, some sort of homage, gift, or respect to those people and not Eva. You know, that's just the way I see it. And at the very end of the day, the decision should be Eva's. You know, um, Ronnie and Shamari with their party. Girl, you see they got their yard together, honey. They had them put them bounce houses over them patches in their grass. Nevertheless, it was good to see them put their birthday party together. We've seen many of parties with the Real Housewives of Atlanta over the 11 years they've been on. And they did their party right or whatever. They spent their mortgage money throwing a party. They'll just call Countrywide next month and try to make an arrangement. You already know how it go. They'll be in the blogs two months going into bankruptcy. But they had a nice party though. Nevertheless, Ronald DeVoe was at the table. He was not happy about Shamari discussing that open relationship stuff down to the table. Now, is it me? Or are y'all getting something about Shamari's recantment of the open relationship is not sitting right with me. Per Shamari's words, it would seem that basically she fell in love with the woman that she was dating and Ronnie was the one who ultimately was hurt the most by the open relationship. Like, that's what I'm getting. But then there's another part of me because she keeps reiterating the point that she's the one that asked for it and that she's the one that initiated. It's a large part of me that feels like she's covering for some of his infidelity and that she's trying to make it seem like she wasn't stupid, kind of like how tiny was and just basically, um, you know, entering into threesomes and open relationships in an effort to keep a man who was already cheating. Like, I don't know, something about the way she described that situation is just a little off for me. Coupled with the fact that he gets so bothered by the fact that people are knowing it, which means it's a shame point for him. Which makes me feel like, nah, Shamari, this nigga was running around and you just adopted this open relationship shit to kind of make it better and to swallow the medicine down a little easier. I don't know, it's just something about that story that I'm not particularly buying. Um, Greg and Nene meet in the kitchen, y'all. That was a sad scene. And Greg was sitting there making that, that shake. And, you know, it's scary because I looked at that shake and was like, God forbid, you know, anything happened to me health-wise that I have to get into them type of shakes because, you know, yeah, it may have tasted good because it was forced. You, you, you know how stuff... You find a way to get through it, like sex with somebody who's gonna give you some money, you got a bill due, you really not attracted to the person, but you just find a way to get through it. That's what that is with them spinach shakes. I don't give a good goddamn what nobody says. That shit ain't good, okay? If it was meant for us to drink, drink slobbed up like applesauce like that, that's how nature would have provided it. That shit was nasty. You got to put pineapples in the spinach to make it taste good because you can't use sugar or you can use agave, nectar, hunting this, and that's just way too much for my spleen and my blood pressure. Nevertheless, it was very sad when Greg and Nene got the call about the microscopic cancer particles being in his body. And then when Greg said, my faith just went through the roof. Um, you know, moments like that really can shake a person's faith and alter their belief, but you have to hold to it that at the very end, it's going to work out for your good. I think in this situation, And I always get on this about religion. And there is a point where religion and faith must intersect with logic. And, you know, people say trust in God, trust in God, trust in God, and rightfully so. But sometimes do we ever stop to think that maybe God put doctors in place and maybe God put the chemotherapy in place to heal and to save you? Perhaps that is the route that he wants you to take. And you're so hell bent on doing it your way. And I'm going to tell you something. And this is the 30 second preaching moment. I have learned in this life. And it has gotten me through. So many times we go through so much mental turmoil. Trying to do things our way. 
or I like to say considering an option that is not present. You know what I'm saying? For me right now, it seems like Greg's only two options are, you know, run the risk of getting sick or do the chemotherapy. Run the risk of getting sick or doing the chemotherapy and the confusion rests in he and Nene trying to exercise or explore a third option that really doesn't exist. Um, you know, I have, my grandmother went through colon cancer. My mom ultimately died from ovarian cancer. When my grandma went through chemo the first time, you know, she was well and her cancer was in remission. When her cancer came back, she opted not to do the chemo. Um, so, you know, I guess it made her so sick the first time. She just opted not to do it. Now, you know, I was in college a large part of the time when my grandmother was going through chemo, so I didn't have to sit there and watch her do it. But I couldn't imagine something making you so sick that you rather die. You know, and I coupled with the fact that my grandmother was old and she probably thought her work here on earth was done. But I do know the determining factor in her not wanting to do the chemo the second time around is because it made her really sick. So I'm just praying for Nene and Greg and I hope that, um, you know, that Greg can get through the chemotherapy if he chooses to do it safely and um, we just get back to living. You know, Greg, I'm rooting for you. I know it's going to make you sick as a dog, but it's six months out of a lifetime. Let's just go ahead and knock them six months out and uh, get back to living. <clears throat> Girl, we get back to Shamari party. Not only did Marlo steal her outfit, she stole a baby. Children and family people. Children and family people. They say y'all was losing Isaiah, but we found them, bitch. Marlo had to have them hiding one of them stolen ass Dooney and Burks in her damn closet next to the rest of Neiman Marcus stuff. Child, who oh baby that is Marlo had? Child. Oh, you know, you know what else I meant to touch on, too? When the ladies had went down to the table, and they was like... Um, all right, y'all, let's go shopping. Candy, give me your car as we go shopping. Quiet as it's kept, Candy. That bitch probably already got it. Let me tell y'all something. Some, I had a dream, and somebody came to me and told me Marlo Hampton was a witch. That bitch could look at your score and telepathically get your social security number. You better check your damn account, Candy. Nene, she was vying for your car too. Talk about she could go shopping with y'all car. Bitch, you already did. You were <laughs> quiet as it's kept. Um... Candy pull up and talk about put $100 each in that car for them kids. Todd was like, oh, I don't even know them damn kids. I know that's goddamn right, Todd shit. Todd said, bitch, I'm trying to hold on to all the OLG money. And then Candy said, at least 100 each. Let me tell you something. I can't wait financially till I get on a level where I'm able to just so, you know, arbitrarily just be like, put a $100 bill in a car for a one-year-old. I'm getting ready to go to my niece's five, fifth five-year-old party this weekend in Tampa. And I don't know if she getting $100. I mean, she might get the 50. She might get the 50. But I, she, you know, and I'm the type of person, I would spend $100 on stuff before I give the child $100 in cash. And I know that's ass backwards because at the end of the day, the net effect to my bank account is the same. But it must be nice. Um... Shamari, when they were sitting down to your party and Eva came and you was, you know, getting in your feelings about needing a makeover and you was like, I know I look good. You do look good and you need a makeover. Um, physically, you're beautiful. Face-wise, you're beautiful. Fashions, I mean, you know, to be determined. Nevertheless, you can look good. People out there, you can look good and need a makeover at the same time. Those two can exist in the same space. And last but not least, Cynthia opening a wine bar. Okay, Cynthia, I guess. I mean, I mean, Cynthia, did, is the Bailey agency even doing what it's supposed to be doing over there? <laughs> Quiet as a cap. Is it? Is it over there doing what they supposed to be doing before you go and open up another business? And, uh, Candy decided she was going to come clean to Portia. Portia handled that very well, and Nene, you lying. And see, Bravo doing a real good job of, like, starting shit, because Portia clearly says Nene came and told her. Nene says she did it. And you could tell that Nene told her because the way they both reacted at the table when Candy brought it up. Nene, Portia was like, did I say she said? 
And Nene was like, hold up, hold up. That was a dead giveaway right there. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened. Nene and Portia had a conversation. Nene said, I'm going to tell you this. Do not tell them I told you. And if it ever come out, I'm going to say no, that I didn't say it or whatever. And that was the arrangement. And Nene went on and told her. Nene should have probably went on and told her that this was going on. But she should have also just been like, you know, I'll have a talk with her about what folks are saying, and particularly Candy. Um, Portia, I really like the way you handled that. You explained it very well. To Candy in terms of I don't know what you said I don't know what your intentions are it got back to me it got back to Dennis and the way it looked prior to getting back to us from his vantage point it looks messy and it ain't that from his vantage point that it looks messy it is messy Candy can discuss Dennis with Carmen and Tom and everybody else she want all day long but you already know doing it on camera what is going to come on now? She been, you've been playing this game long enough, which far, furthermore leads me to believe that a lot of this is intentional on Candy's behalf because she ain't got nothing else to do. Because Candy ain't stupid by a long shot, and she got enough sense to know what this was going to look like on TV. Nevertheless, Nessa girl, that was some Real Housewives of Atlanta. Did Mary the Madison come on last night? I got to check my DVR. If so, I'll do that after I land at the 3 o'clock. I'll call you later, girl. Bye.